All right, here we go.
and rhythm of the creative profiles. How extraordinary was that? And that was done quite a while ago, but it sounds brand new. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everyone to our live stream of Aesthetically Speaking Music, ASM. And <clears throat> we have an incredible session for you tonight. And I hope that you will feel comfortable and settle in and join us for this incredible journey that we're about to undertake with our very special guest, which we will introduce shortly. But before we do that, before I read the, our mission statement, which is something that we do traditionally to bring everybody into what we want to do with our concept, um, I'd like to uh, have a few words from Juan Cardoso and Ilham, please, come it. Ladies first, or men, however you oh, Yeah, you can go Ilham if you want to go first. Go ahead, oh, bro. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, welcome everyone. Good evening. Um, uh, we are very glad to have this amazing musician, educator, composer, choir director, uh, Dr. Silver Holyfield. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be around, you know, such a great set of musicians and teachers. And there's a saying, I forgot who, who is from, that says that, you know, uh, in, in order to be a good musician, you should be around better musicians than yourself, you know, and uh, mm. you always learn with, with people uh, when you're around people who have much no much more knowledge than you. So it's always a great pleasure and um, an honor to be here. And for all of you who, who are watching us on YouTube uh, and you don't know about our, uh, our work, we're going to talk a little bit more about it uh, at some point. But uh, please press the like button, you know, uh, subscribe to our channel. This really help uh, YouTube to send these to more people and to, to these people who get to know Dr. Sylvia Holyfield. So uh, yeah, just uh, welcome everyone. And I'm looking forward for this amazing night. Uh, let me add really quickly, if there's anyone that has any, if you're on YouTube, please use the chat for any questions or concerns that you may have. This is very important to the growth of what we're doing with aesthetically speaking music. And please use the chat for questions or things. And we'll, we will get to all of the questions or concerns you might have during the course of our evening. Uh, Ilham, would you please uh, like to chime in, please? You were muted a minute ago. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. <laughs> um, I want just to add that uh, I'm so happy to be here and uh, to meet uh, Sylvia. And uh, I met her three days ago. And I learned so much since Tuesday, you know, and uh, I'm so grateful for that. And yeah, it would be just wonderful. Thank you. You know, Ilham, uh, we, we have a, a few French speakers on tonight. And if you could please welcome them in French, that would be wonderful. Eh bien, <laughs> que dire euh, bah, vous êtes les bienvenus à notre émission euh, de ce soir avec euh, Madame Sylvia Holyfield euh, Turner et euh, dans l'émission de Aesthetically Speaking Music, donc, euh, voilà, son, son, comme son nom l'indique. Et euh, j'espère que vous allez passer un super moment avec nous. Et, euh, et, et n'hésitez pas à partager avec d'autres personnes comme ça, elles pourront nous rejoindre également. Merci, bonne soirée à vous. Merci, merci. <laughs> Je vous en prie. Thank you, sister. And, and, and as, as is our custom or our tradition or what has become our tradition is that I always like to read the um, ASM Aesthetically Speaking Music vision statement before we get, jump into what we, well, into our business, I should say. The vision for ASM has a multi-layered purpose to incorporate and bring attention to the creative and ever-evolving musical cultures of African and African diasporic music. ASM allows people throughout the globe through listening, research, and technology to exp experience the historical, aesthetic, educational, and therapeutic values in music for all people. The vision of ASM will be valued by future generations as it helps to enlighten and educate underserved communities on the cultural values of musical expressions and its significance through videos, interviews, historic references, and discussions. ASM will attract listeners and seekers throughout the globe. The vision of ASM is to bridge generations that seem to be separated only by choice, 
by creating platforms in communities, in schools, in nursing and convalescent facilities, and especially in correctional institutions. This is done through the therapeutic, educational, and aesthetic values instilled by the creators and those who continue to bear the cultural traditions. Ashe. And I do want to say that we have a very, very, very special guest um, tonight that I have been, uh, <laughs> I've known for many, 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 many years, and I, I'm not going to go start counting because I ran out of fingers a while ago. But nonetheless, what what an incredible uh, guest that we will have uh, tonight. And I am going to read her biography, her wonderful biography right now. And then we're going to do something very special for you. Sylvia Turner Holyfield, PhD, is a native of Detroit, Michigan. She attended Detroit Public Schools, graduating from the Vocational Music Curriculum of Cass Technical High School. Me too. At Cass Technical High School, she was a member of the Harp Ensemble and Choirs. She received her BS and MED, Master's in Education, in Vocal Music Education. Continuing her studies, Sylvia has also received an MA in Guidance and Counseling and an Educational Specialist Certificate in Administration and Supervision. Furthering her studies, Sylvia received a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies from Wayne State University. Musically, ha, ah, ah, ha, musically. Musically, she has served as a choral director, orchestral conductor, pianist, harpist, and clinician. She is the director of the Cathedral Choir at Hartford Memorial Baptist Church. She also served as Minister of Music at various churches in the Detroit, Michigan area. Sylvia is the founder, executive director of Michigan Sings Incorporated, which is a 501c3 to support vocal music programs in the Detroit Public Schools Community District in grades seven through 12. The program has served hundreds of students in DPS, Detroit Public Schools, bringing together students, composers, conductors, and musicians from across the country. As a composer and under the banner of her company, Sans Opus 118 LLC, she has written and published choral works for SSA, for, for those of you that may not know what SSA is, Soprano, Soprano, Alto, and SSAA, Soprano, Soprano, Alto, Alto, SAB, SATB, which is Soprano, Alto, Tenor, and Bass, or yes, and then TTBB, which would be Tenor, Tenor, Bass, or maybe baritone and bass. You know, Sylvia, you can clarify that. Various ensembles across the country have performed the, her pieces. One of her most recent works, written for solo voice and piano, is titled Shades of Hues. The piece, her pieces were performed at the African American Art Song Alliance Conference held in Irvine, California in 2022. The selections are set are settings of poetry by Langston Hughes. She is also published published in, she's also published in, I'm sorry, an anthology of African and African diasporic songs. Diaspora songs. Currently, she is working on a song cycle on the poetry of the great Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Sylvia is on the board of directors of the National Association of Negro Musicians, NAM, Incorporated a historic organization since 1919. Her professional membership includes Sigma Alpha Iota Incorporated and the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development and the American Choral Directors Association. I want to welcome 
Dr. Sylvia Turner Hollyfield to ASM. Thank you, Sylvia. But before we go into it, we want to show a poetry reading of Sylvia's and then she's going to jump in. Okay. Can we hear that? You're muted, Sylvia. That will come from Elham. Yes. Elham. You're going to do the French? Okay. Um, if she will do the poésie, French, c'est uh, de Gwendoline Brooks. Uh, la, la, la poésie de Gwendoline Brooks et il s'intitule Nous sommes vraiment cool. Uh, les joueurs de billard, c'est à l'appel d'or. Nous sommes vraiment cool. Nous, quitter l'école. Nous, se cache tard. Nous, frapper tout droit. Nous, chante le péché. Nous, finis le jean. Nous, jazz juin. Nous, mourir bientôt. Wonderful. Sylvia Turner Hollyfield. Well, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. I hope that you are able to see my screen. Um, is it available? Can you yes, see it? We can, we can see it perfectly. Okay. I First of all, I want to say how uh, grateful I am to be a part of this broadcast and uh, seeing my old friend, uh, Ralph. We go way back in time, as he said it, stated. And also uh, the music at the beginning, I want to thank you for reminding me of things that I have done in the past. And I just want to kind of take you through a journey. I want to say hello to those who are on here. I see Denise Bates and I think Denise has been on here before. I'm not sure if she performed. So I just want to give a shout out to you. And uh, it's nice meeting you. And I see June Ann McDonald, I think, on. So I want to welcome you, too, and anybody else that is watching in any other format. So as I was asked about uh, doing this, I thought the best thing to do would be really to talk about my journey. And so I'm calling it a backwards glance, evolution of a musician in progress. And I was smiling as I listened to two things from my past. Uh, the first one with the Hastings Street Jazz Experience, which was entitled Song for M. I played the harp on that song, and it was just a great collective of musicians. And then the second piece was the Voices of Creative Profile with Harold McKinney, uh, an ensemble. And it was so much that I learned from both of those experiences back in the day, which I would call the 70s. So I think when I reflect on that, sometimes you don't know why things are occurring in your life until you have a chance to look back. So I hope that one of the things that you will see tonight will be an opportunity for you to reflect on your own experience, but I'm going to tell you about mine. Mm. Early on in my life, I, I think I may have come out of the womb as a musician, I'm not sure. I don't even think I really had a choice because my parents were musicians. And so I think that was uh, destined to be my journey in life as well. Some of the things that I remember early in my life um, was that one of my favorite songs was and it was a collection of spirituals, actually. It was God's Trombones that was done by James Weldon Johnson. And I listened to that like it was a 45. For those of you that don't know what a 45 is, it was when <laughs> music used to be on vinyl and it would be maybe a minute and 40 seconds. And that was the long version. But I really love God's Trombones. It was an LP. And for some reason, I would play that every day on what was called a high five at that time. Not high five, but a high five. <laughs> and so as I think about that 
James Weldon Johnson and then living at this point in my life and actually understanding who he is and the impact that he made on my life, I can see that seeds were being planted that I was not aware of. My other favorite song was Hit the Road Jack and all of his iterations by Ray Charles. But I also loved hymns and I also loved spirituals. My father was a choral director and a band director. And so early on, uh, we started going to music gatherings, choir rehearsals, particularly. And that's where I fell in love with spirituals. So uh, I, I want to share that because I think we all start from somewhere and we don't really know where we may be going in life, but the seeds are planted and then you begin to be this work in pro progress. So I'll keep talking about that. As a performer, I began early on, I started taking piano lessons at four. And by six, I remember being on a stage at a place called Baldwin Hall in Detroit. I'm sorry, yes, that's what it was called, Baldwin Hall. And it was the auditorium of the place that sold Steinway pianos. And as I think about that little hall with that stage and being on that stage playing the piano, and I would always take my shoe off for whatever reason, my right shoe and uh, just swing my leg. That worried my mother considerably. But I remember just being and standing on that stage and hearing applause and grateful that I was able to get through my little song and people seemed to enjoy it. So I think that would be my earliest memories of performances. In my house, we had music every day. We all played instruments. I have three other siblings. We all played instruments uh, and we all began on the piano and we all had the same teacher. I'll give a shout out to him. He's no longer with us. His name is Dean Robert Nolan. And I found out much later in life that not only did he attend Howard University, but he was the pianist for the Eva Jesse Correll, which was the choir for the first Porgy and Bess. So sometimes you have these historical figures in your life that you really don't know what they've done before because it's life is like a freeway. We enter in on different times and come in on different entrances. And sometimes we just kind of move on to wherever it is that this journey is taking us. So I uh, wanted to give a shout out to him uh, because he was very instrumental in my life um, as a teacher and then as a performer. So that was my piano beginning. And then when I went to high school, I became involved in playing the harp, mainly because I played the piano. But it was then that I learned about not only performing as a solo artist, but also performing with others. Uh, I had a choice to make in my life whether I was going to go on a road, on the road with somebody that I will leave unnamed at this time, or whether I was going to teach. And I'm not a night person, so the fact of having a gig at 11 p.m. was not anything that I was <laughs> interested in. And I knew early on, I said if I could get my harp uh, in the car and back to my home, I would finish my degree, which I really had no choice, and I was going to teach school. And I don't regret it to this day that I did not go out on the road, that I decided to come back and be a teacher so that I could help other people enjoy music as much as I do and as I did at that time. But I also found out that I could not only teach during the day, that I could perform at night. So as far as I'm concerned, I had the best of both worlds. 
as Ralph had said earlier, uh, I am and was a church musician. My first choir I had at the age of 14 years old. And it was an experience for me because uh, the choir <laughs> did not come in when I wanted them to come in. They didn't sing. So I just kept playing the piano and I said, if you want to jump in, you just jump in. But I went through and did the song. But being a church musician and a choir director has been very uh, instrumental in my life. It has been a pivotal point in my life for a variety of reasons. Uh, there was a choir that I had. And when I first took the choir, there were very few members in it probably about eight to 10. And we were able to grow to about 54 members. It was a great experience for me because it helped me learn how not only to work with people, but things that you can push yourself to do. I'm not a great person at improvisation. That's something that I have to work on. And maybe it's because of my classical music training, I'm not sure, but I did. I was not able to make that flip like other people have. But being able to work with a group of people who were willing to go with you, whether you went to the mat or the moon, was such an invigorating experience for me to be able to have that choir at that time in my life, because I know that we're always in progress. I knew that it was a way for me to grow. Um, I have always liked gospel music. Uh, one of my favorite people is uh, Richard Smallwood. I think that he just merged together the classical and the gospel. Uh, always like Kirk Franklin. I remember seeing Kirk Franklin before he said, you think gospel music has gone too far. And he was already way ahead of the curve at that time. I think that was about 1990 that uh, I actually had an opportunity to meet him. But I say that because church music has just been mm, very influential in my life. Uh, my father was a church musician, and I think, again, when you say you're not going to be your parent, you really grow up to be one of your parents and maybe a combination thereof. As an advocate, uh, as a music teacher, and this is in many urban school districts, um, that the first thing to go when they're making cuts is music education and arts education. And I'm not sure why people don't think it's important, but it always has bothered me that that is the first to go. And so in order to do what I consider my part after uh, I was no longer teaching music and had left the, the district I was working in, I thought that I would do something for the students, particularly the students in Detroit public schools. If you know anything about competitions for music, uh, we have what is called solo and ensemble festivals. Oh, and wow. it, it's competitive. And so mm -hmm. students go there with great dreams of getting a one. And it's, it's very competitive and Sometimes spirits and musical, what could be potential musical careers can be crushed. And they can be crushed because somebody said you weren't good enough. And when that happens, we begin to lose students. And so I decided that the district needed some, an impetus of doing things in a way where we were not competitive. And I started Michigan Sings um, as a way to bring all of the students who were involved in choirs in their schools together. And we spent a whole day singing. That's all we did. We sang all day. I brought in clinicians and composers and different people who would come and work with the students. And then at the end of the 
evening, we would do a concert and they would sing music that they wanted to sing for each ensemble. And then we would all sing together. It was a great collection of bringing students together. And some of those students have gone to do wonderful things, not necessarily because of Michigan Sings, but because of the wonderful teachers that they have had in their schools that work with them. And one of the students who I call a music magnet has just done wonderful things and has a wonderful choir in another city and state now. I'll give a shout out about him later. So as an advocate and an organizer, those are some of the things that I've done, but all of them from even being in elementary school and being in district chorus and being in honors choir and being in harp ensemble, all of those things have just kind of led me to the space that I am in now. So I'm gonna stop for a minute in case somebody has some questions. And the last part that I will talk about this musician in progress, or the next part actually will be about how I became a composer. And I, I think uh, that's a, a different type of journey for me. It wasn't anything that I, I looked to do, but I want to uh, talk a little bit more about that and stop talking so much about me. So I don't know if there's any questions or anything. I've said quite a bit. Uh, if not, I'll keep it moving. Somebody Do we have any it? questions? Are there any uh, questions in the chat? Uh, let me say this one thing. Um, Sylvia, we, we, we have conjured up Roberto Huckabee Hill. Hi, it's, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Yes, give her a shout out because you guys sang in choir together. Yes, and, we did. And, yeah, we all went to high school together. What a wonderful time that was. Yes, and our paths have crossed since that time. Mm. <laughs> okay, so should I keep going? Uh, yeah. Just uh, just let you know, on YouTube, we didn't have questions, but we had okay. uh, some greetings from Charles Crooks, of course. Yeah. Hey, Charles. <laughs> and Kalila M., who is oh. thank, uh, thanking us for this platform. And you're welcome. It's uh, my pleasure, and I think everyone's pleasure in here. So that's it, just to share with you what we have so far on YouTube. Okay, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So I'm going to keep going, and the teacher and me will probably call out people, but I won't do that today. I'll just, I'll just keep going. Okay, so as a composer, um, I think everything. comes as a result of influences in your life. And I talked briefly about me being a performer, uh, as a teacher, church musician, advocate organizer and composer. And, and there I put them in categories like that, but they overlap. And so I may go back to some, but they do overlap. Uh, in so many ways to make me who I am today. So as a composer, I want to just talk briefly about some of the people on here. You don't know them, but I think that you should always give honor to whom honor is due because you do not get where you are, whatever the discipline may be, based on your own volition. There's not something that just came and hit you on the head and said you would be the only one. So in the center of all of these influences, and I will talk briefly about each one and why, is my parents. My parents were the winds beneath my wings. Without them, I don't know what I would have been. And I hope there's no one on here that's an accountant or anything like that or an attorney, but it has to be boring. I can't think of anything more interesting uh, than, than being a musician. So as I said earlier, my first person uh, was Dean Robert L. Nolan. He was my piano teacher. I started with him at four. I continued with him until I was 17. I had to go to another teacher uh, because he wasn't at the university and I took 
lessons from someone on faculty there uh, at Wayne State University, and then I went back to Dean Nolan. Uh, Philippa Schuyler was a concert pianist, and I went to see her when I was very young, and I was just in awe of her being on that stage with that big piano. And uh, unfortunately, she died in an airplane crash, but I have always um, been moved by her and that performance, her walking out on that stage and sitting at that big piano. Carol Coleman was a harpist at Cast Tech and she was in the orchestra before I got there. But I remember going to the concert, I must've been in junior high, and I just thought she looked so elegant at the harp. And I said, if ever I go to cast, that's what I would like to do. Uh, Beverly Thomas is a pianist, an organist, a cellist, and now a visual artist. Uh, when she was 14, um, my father hired her to be the organist at the church that we attended. She has been a mentor to me in so many facets of my life, uh, more than a musician. Uh, but I have always wanted to walk into walk in her shoes. And then I found out that uh, my our shoe sizes were different. And so uh, I can't walk in her shoes. And I have, as she told me, I've walked in my own. And I have always appreciated her. And I want to make sure that I give homage to everyone that I'm sharing with you, even though you don't know these people, because I need everybody to understand that you don't get where you are on your own. There's always somebody that has done something before you. The next person is Dorothy Ashby. I am so fortunate that I had an opportunity to study harp with Dorothy Ashby. Uh, if you don't know who she is, please look her up, put her on your playlist. She is one of a kind. I know there's new harpists out there. They're doing new things. They're wearing high heel shoes and stilettos playing the harp, which Velma uh, would never allow us to do. Uh, and I'm not throwing shade on them, but, you know, it's a new day and I understand it and, and I love listening to them. But Dorothy Ashby was the quintessential musician. Not only was she a harpist, she was a pianist, she was a singer, she was one of the first women to have a trio. Um, it was her husband, her brother, the drummer, and she was the, the headliner. Uh, Dorothy Ashby moved to Santa Monica, probably back in the 80s. But in the 60s and 70s, she and her husband did a multitude of plays that were really well conceived and done. But most importantly, please look for Dorothy Ashby. She's been on recordings. She's played with some, some of everybody in the world. Uh, and I think the one that I like the most is with Stevie Wonder. Um, I can't remember the song right now, but she plays it's the magic. Harp. It's, it's magic. magic. Thank you. Thank you. And then the other person is Arcola Clark. Arcola Clark is another harpist. Um, she has been, I believe, either Vienna or Austria. No, she's been in Vienna, don't get me started. Uh, and played with the symphony, fantastic harpist, fantastic harpist. And so one thing that I see on this, if I look at these first influences that are that, I was gonna play the piano and I was gonna play the harp. I did not plan to do that in, that, in my life, but as I look at these people, that have surrounded my life. They have been great influences on my life. The next group of influences come from, again, my parents, my parents, but also opportunities that help to shape me as a musician. The first one is my dad. He had his own choir. It was called the Talmadge L. Turner Corral. And my sister, my brother, and I were all in it. We both had an opportunity to join him in a variety of capacities. 
the Great Lakes Choir was owned by a black owned um, insurance company in the Detroit area. My father was the director of the Great Lakes Choir. It is where I heard spirituals um, that have resonated with me even still today. There is nothing like a spiritual. I had the opportunity to play in, in the Elmwood Casino Band. I ended up actually going to the Elmwood Casino, which is in Windsor, um, to do dinner theater. Um, and they were looking for a harpist. And I ended up, uh, I started there for, I think the show was Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. I think was the name of the show. And I went there for like a four or six week stint. And I ended up staying the entire year. I did about three or four more shows. And I ended up in the house band. Uh, and we would play on Friday and Saturday after the shows. But I think what I learned from that experience, beside playing with the father of a friend of mine, is that maybe I was not really going to be a jazz pianist. Um, but I could play and I enjoyed the experience, but I learned a lot about how I had to listen differently because everything is not one, four, five. And Ralph should understand that statement. Uh, I also had the opportunity to be with two uh, theater companies, the Petty Players, uh, which was a local group, learned a lot about that. We did some great plays. Um, done with, with two brothers. One wrote the libretto and other wrote the music. But being their music director, uh, we did a lot of different things together and I appreciate what they brought to my life. The Ashby players I've already talked about. And then Wayne State University Women's Corral. With Women's Corral, uh, I had an opportunity. I was asked by the uh, director, the conductor at that time, uh, his name is Dennis Teeny. if I would start a group. And we did, there were 10 of us, uh, we were called Odyssey, um, uh, which I based on 2001 Space Odyssey because it just sounded like a good name. And it was a group of very talented women. We, we were uh, a capsule of, of talent because not only did we have a variety of pianists, we had a flautist, we had a bassist, and we had a drummer all in the same group. So uh, it was great. We, it was a good experience for me and gave me an opportunity to enhance my playing skills in a different genre. This is my last group. Um, Again, my parents are in the center and I probably have one more group as I think about it. Uh, the Voices of Creative Profile, which you heard uh, with Harold McKinney. That, I, I tell you, look up Harold McKinney. He was a prolific musician and pianist. He is the only person that I've ever known in my life that could literally destroy a Fender Rose 88 piano because his hands were so heavy, he was. He had big hands and he could just really, he just took up the whole piano. Yeah. Uh, but his whole concept of bringing together a group of people to learn music that he, he arranged and composed. Some of the tunes on there, uh, he wrote the lyrics to Dolphin Dance, which I think is just a classic. But being in that group and the musicians at that time, you don't realize what you're doing, you're just in it. But when you look back, as I say, a backwards glance, you are just so grateful for all of these influences that you've had in your life. I had an opportunity to be with Lonnie Smith, the organist. Uh, some people might remember the song, Move Your Hand, that was a big hit of his at that time, but he was a B3 organist. And uh, just a great influence on my life. It's funny how you hear somebody and you listen to their music. When I was in college, every Friday night, we would have these jazz jams where we would just <laughs> listen to jazz. And Lonnie Smith was one of my favorite persons. And when I had the opportunity 
uh, to play with him and go out on the road with him. I, it was a highlight of, of my life. Um, he is deceased now, but just a great musician and a wonderful friend. And he used to call me Kadee, like in Chickadee. So I think of the whole thing, I would rather be Kadee than a chick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, the New Art Quintet was a local group of five musicians. I don't know how I got in the group. I just know I was in the group and I played harp with another great ensemble of people, musicians locally. Some have done things nationally, but another opportunity to also let me know, I never wanted to be the only girl in the band because they treated me like a girl. Um, and that's a good thing, but they always wanted, they were very, very protective, but it was a great experience for me to find out what I could do. And one of the first groups that made me sing, I never wanted to sing a solo ever, but they made me sing and it was Little B's poem. And uh -oh. every time I hear it, I, I can still sing the words today. I will not honor you with that today. So please know that that will not happen. <laughs> Highlight in my life was uh, playing with Grady Tate and Johnny Lytell. But particularly Grady Tate, because that year uh, he came out with the album that had Bridges and Sack Full of Dreams, which is still one of my favorite LPs. I know they don't call them that anymore, but I was so honored and so excited to be able uh, to be with him as he was doing that. Uh, Ed Nelson was on the first album that you heard uh, with the Hastings Streets jazz composer series. Uh, he was very influential too, a drummer, a nice guy, uh, and a colleague, and just a great educator. And then finally, Marcus Belgrave, who was a trumpeter. He used to play a trumpeter, yes. He played with um, Ray Charles for a long time, uh, but just a powerhouse of a musician here in the Detroit area when I met him, but he had a whole life um, before I even met him, but just a force. And along with Marcus and another musician from here uh, named Ed, uh, we had a publishing company together uh, years ago. So I wanted to talk about those influences. Are there any questions or any comments? Cause I will keep going. I have a question, Sylvia. Yes. Um, what was your inspiration for writing that song for the Hastings Street uh, Ensemble song for M? Who mm -hmm. was M and or what was it that inspired you to write that piece? Because that that obviously came very early in your uh, musical uh, evolution and um, you did that and then you moved on to new new and different things. But what was it about that particular composition? I was very, very uh, impressed by that, I'm, you know. So I just wanted to know what inspired you to do that. Okay, so it's, it's two, it's a couple of M's. There's my nephew who is named Marcellus. Um, and then there's Marcus, as in Belgrade. And then there's also, um, there's another M. I can't think of it right now, but those two I know because they're a little close, to, <laughs> close together, Marcus and Marcellus. I think when in this time in my life, um, I was experimenting. And because I played the harp, people thought that was such an anomaly. And I guess it, in, in essence, it was because there are not a lot of harpists. And I guess if you're around a lot of harpists, it seems like there's a lot of harpists, but they're not. And um, I think when we were working on this project, they said, well, you should write something. And I'm like, I'm not a composer. And they said, no, you should write something. You can write something. So I sat down and I just started writing. And uh, as I listen back to it, it's, it's really kind of interesting um, 
to hear it play because at, I was actually playing, but it was something about the harp, even today, where people just feel it's that that instrument. People remember me playing like out in the park. They remember all of these experiences that I had. It's been a long time um, since I played that song. So listening back, you know, today in the last probably week or two, listening to it, I, I'm still amazed that that's, that's something that I did. But I think the people that I was with around that time were really um, instrumental, no and pun intended, in saying that this was something that I could do. And so when you create something and you hear it back and people give you good feedback, you try to continue to do that. So that was the one song I listened to some of the other songs that were on that um, album at that time. And it's, it just brings back a lot of memories. But I'm just glad that they thought enough of me uh, as a musician to ask me to be a part of that. Um, I feel special because I think I was the only female <laughs> on that uh, project. And uh, I'm glad that they asked me when I look back. Uh, there's a saying that says that you will regret more the things that you didn't do than the things that you did do. And so I am glad that that is something that happened along my life's path. And when I look at this, because I've always been in school. I just think, you know, I'm, I'm just a glutton for punishment with school. But when I think of this collection of, of musicians, how I went from just knowing about church music, just knowing about spirituals, uh, gospel, and then getting into the, the jazz idiom, so to speak, um, has just really made me a more holistic person because of my collection of experiences. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Wow. Influences again. I know this is like, this is my life. So please forgive me. They asked me about what it was. So I, this is who I am. Dr. Robert A. Harris was my teacher when I was in undergrad at Wayne. He had also been in my father's choir uh, as a youngster. My father was influential with a lot of musicians in Detroit. But Dr. Robert Harris uh, is a retired professor, uh, composer, taught composition, over choral uh, activities, et cetera. Dr. Roland M. Carter uh, should be called the godfather of Lift Every Voice and Sing, the concert arrangement. Uh, if you've ever heard any of the HBCUs and particularly during uh, COVID and the pandemic, I, I, so many choirs have done it. But his, for me, is the quintessential arrangement, the concert version of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Miss Nina Scott and the United Voices of Detroit. I have to speak about Nina Scott and the United Voices of Detroit. It was when I joined that group or when I first heard them, they were one of the first choirs that did my music. Um, and I shouldn't say that, not one of the first choirs, but they were very inspirational Um in me beginning to think about composing. It was a wonderful choir of about 40 people at that time. And there were a lot of composers in that group, uh, some that I knew, some I had never heard of, but the voices, the United Voices of Detroit and Nina Scott, uh, the first song that I ever did for them was an acapella arrangement of America the Beautiful, because I've always felt that that really should be uh, the national anthem. Yep, I said it, because the Star Spangled Banner is not a beautiful song. It's hard to sing. It's, uh, it's a lot of different things. But nevertheless, I decided to do an arrangement of America the Beautiful. And when you write something, you never know how people are 
going to react to it. You just hope that they'll like it. Uh, and they did, and it worked really well. So I have to talk about them. Stacy Gibbs is a composer of spirituals. That's what he's known most for. Uh, if you get a chance, I would also say look him up. He's one of our outstanding uh, composers uh, of this era. A lot of people um, talk about Moses Hogan uh, and some of the other writers, uh, William Dawson, so many different people that have written spirituals. Uh, but he would be one. And now there's like what I call the new school people like Brandon Waddles, Marcus Garrett. There's a whole lot of other new composers. Harp and vocal, of course, at Cass Tech um, and the Cheever's Ladies Ensemble of DSA. Those two groups have been what I would call my muses uh, because I there's something about their voices that just really resonated with me. So they also uh, gave me an opportunity not only to write, but also to hear the music perform, which has been amazing. So I have them because they are my muses. So we're not going to hear Calvary, but at least you know that I really, I think, started out as a composer with, um, I think the first song that I ever wrote was words when I was in elementary school to, I can't even remember the tune, but I was in elementary school. And then I remember writing a acapella arrangement of the Lord's Prayer, because it just seemed easy and I didn't like the way my uh, accompaniment may have sounded. So I just took that route out. But as time goes on and you become a little bit more brave and a little bit more confident about um, your music, whether you are a singer or you're an instrumentalist, um, I think we all grow. I was being groomed to be a concert pianist, and that means you play the music on the paper and you interpret it and you play every note exactly as it's written with the expression that it has. And there's very little nuances where I think arranging gave me a little bit more latitude. And so I think, am I supposed to play um, this? But before I, I get to that, uh, Calvary arranged uh, for cello and flute, uh, cello and piano, wanted to hear what that would sound like. Uh, Still Away, I arranged for harp and flute. Uh, as a throwback to uh, harp and vocal um, and their voices. I've just always liked uh, ladies' voices. So the next thing that I have, uh, and I think it's time to listen to something. So Juan, am I doing this or are you doing the Song of America? Yeah, I can do it. Uh, I just need you to stop the share screen and I can okay. do it. But before... Yeah. Also, we have a question from Adayam Ituri uh, in the chat. He asks, uh, as Grady Tate was a drummer slash vocalist, was it through the, his urging that you sang Little B's tune? That, those were two different groups. I did Little B's, Little B's poem. I did that with the New Art Quintet, um, which was really interesting because, and I again, I think it was because I was the only girl in the band. <laughs> But, uh, and I wasn't playing the harp on it. So uh, that's what I did it. But Grady Tate, those were two separate events. Um, Little B's poem was with New Art Quintet. And then Grady Tate came later. But they were both great experiences. Art songs later. Go ahead. Okay. Later. Let's hear this. Okay. Oh. 
sister oops yeah thank beautiful. you beautiful just beautiful would, would this be considered an art song yes it is an art song and so it's going to take me into the last part of uh how i got here mm. and um <laughs> Yeah, a, a lot of people, and I think we had this conversation briefly because all songs are art songs, but I think the difference is, is usually this is for uh, solo voice and piano accompaniment, usually in the classical tradition or Western tradition. And I think uh, I want to just kind of share a couple of things about that project and then I'll get into those people and I'll almost be done. Um, I fell into, I think, you know, part of life is always being introduced to something new. Um, the song that you just heard, uh, In Time of Silver Rain, is part of a collection of art songs called, uh, it's called Shades of Hues, H-U-E-S, and it is based on the poetry of Langston Hughes, which is one of my favorite poets. A friend of mine asked me out of the clear blue if I would write a couple of songs for him um, based on the poetry of Langston Hughes. And as I looked at him cross-eyed and everything, I was like, I don't know. I've never thought about doing anything like that. That sounds like a lot. But I took the challenge. I've always taken the challenge, uh, except for going to the Grand Canyon and going to stand out on the ledge. I was not doing that. I don't ever have to go there again. I'm good. But when I was asked about it, um, it just seemed like something that I should do. And so I said, well, how many songs are you talking about? And so he said, well, three or four. And I'm like, really? You want me to write three or four different things? And so I got the poetry uh, we came up with uh, My People, which was first. Um, knew I was going to do that because the, the words speak volumes themselves. But I ended up writing six songs. So it's called A Song Cycle because it is based on a group of something that is similar. And in this instance, it is the uh, poetry of Langston Hughes. And so each one I gave a color. Um, I have green, white, black, and I know white's not a color, but green, white, black, red, blue, and purple. And the songs in that song cycle are My People, uh, When Susanna Jones Wears Red, To Our Tina, In Time of Silver Rain, April Rain, April Rain and Song for Billie Holiday. Now, the song for Billie Holiday, I like Billie Holiday. And when I saw that he wrote a poem about Billie Holiday, that was one. I'm born in April. Yes, shout out. My birthday is on Monday, April 1st, for anybody who wants to send me a gift. Uh, <laughs> in time with silver rain. <laughs> uh, I like rain. So uh, he, he, he selected my people. And when Su Susanna Jones wears red, and I'm giving you these because these are, uh, Langston Hughes was a very interesting person to me. Um, being in that period of the Harlem Renaissance has always been fascinating to me. I think in maybe in another life or my, a life that I didn't know about, I was there. Um, and I probably saw Langston, but he didn't see me or vice versa. But I really fell in love with his poetry. 
And I could see where you could write and compose songs on so much of his poetry because he has so much to say. But those were the six that I selected out of that one. I'm currently uh, working on a set of another song cycle on the poetry of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And I think what both of these have forced me to do is learn more about the person, learn more about the, the man or woman behind the poetry, because a lot of times what you see is not what actually is going on. Um, with Paul Lawrence Dunbar, I learned quite a bit uh, about him and his life. And it helps me form a thought process for how to convey the music. So that if somebody's listening to it and they see the title, I hope that they still get the same type of impression that I try to portray through music. I think one of the things that, one of the reasons that I think art songs work for me is because it is a blend of my classical training um, and also freeing myself from the boundaries of what people say should be. I think I have enough musical sense to understand that there is structure in everything, um, that it's either it's gonna have a time signature, it can be in one time signature or more. It can change keys if that's what you wish to do. Um, it can do a whole lot of things if you free yourself. And I think that for me, it's a good marriage of who I am. I'm not trying to be anybody, I think. I mean, I I see such and hear such beautiful music and I, I, I'm putting up some of the people who have influenced me by, by what they've done. But with the, with the art songs and writing music for solo voice, it's just you and the piano. It's just you and the piano. And I admire anybody who sings a solo. Um, oh, what is her name? The new person that just sings, guess who I saw today? Samara Joy. Yeah. When I watch her sing, I have to close my eyes because I see so many people inside of her coming out, even though it's her voice. She's an amazing artist. Gregory Porter, an amazing artist, took his poetry, I understand, and put it to music. And I think of all of the things that anybody could be in the world, to be able to put it to music for everyone to enjoy has to be the quintessential thing that we can do on this planet, whether it's instrumental or vocal. And so for me, art songs gives me the, the concept of art songs, particularly those of African-American poets. You wanna, you wanna do something, put it to music. I think everybody on here can think of a song from uh, one of the advertisements because we hear it so much and it just gets into our spirits. Uh, I wish I would have written the uh, song for Jeopardy uh, because I know it comes on every day and what's it about a minute and 15 seconds or I don't even think they give them a minute. But I, I say that because the influence of music and melody gives us so much. It's such a rich um, tapestry for lack of another word. And it doesn't matter the genre. Every There's enough music to go around. Up though there's only 12 notes, nobody would ever think that out of 12 notes that you could do so much with something. And so with the art song process, 
or the art song genre, it gives me an opportunity to create my own voice for a voice, if that makes any sense. My voice would be the piano, but the voice would be the person communicating the, the message. And so when I think of, of poetry, which I, I really love, I mean, it's so much poetry. One day I said, I want to do uh, For My People by Margaret Walker. And I hope I get, I, I, I'm sure it's Margaret Walker. It's so long, it's almost a symphony, but it's something that I want to tackle because I just think it's so, it's such a historical poem. But I, I listed again, some people who have been influencers that I hope people will uh, look at these names and, and just do your own homework. Uh, Dr. Florence Price, she was the first African-American woman to have a symphony performed by a major orchestra in Chicago, long time ago in the 30s. Margaret Bonds, who was a pianist, composer, and teacher. Uh, Marcia Thomas Corley, she is a African-American pianist and writer of art songs and other genres. Dr. Rosephine Powell, who is a choral composer, vocalist, and professor. She, she just does amazing work. Uh, doctors Manita, Daniel Cox, Marcia Porter, Rosalind Floyd Wright, and Alexis Hazel Davis are part of a group called My, Te My Sister's Keeper. And one of the things that they propel is that it is music of the African-American diaspora. And they are all performing professors. They all have uh, jobs in universities, but as a collective, my, my sister's keeper, they are keeping the music alive and the poetry because it's that that mixture of both music and poetry that is, they're wedded together. And then Dr. Louise Toppin, who I call uh, Superwoman, she's a professor, she's a researcher, she's a singer, uh, if you go to videmus.org, that's V-I-D-E-M-U-S dot org, uh, you can find out about uh, the music of the African diaspora, musicproject.org. Uh, I think she is uh, a superwoman and is doing much to uncover and unearth music of African-American composers that have been laid dormant. Uh, one of the things um, that has happened with much of our music in our poetry is that it is in somebody's basement or in somebody's archives or it's somebody's family who didn't realize who the person was, what they had, and the importance that it contributes to us as a culture. Um, and it's almost a lost art form. So when we can go back as you did, uh, Ralph, and find something from the 70s, uh, that is everything is online now. I went, I always used to tell my students to Google themselves. Well, I decided to do that today. And so when I read about myself and all the information they have online, it's both uh, frightening, but also encouraging. Because I think as we move forward, it's left up to us in this time to do what people did before us because we have a different set of tools to work with. Right now, my tools are to create and compose as much as I can. And I, you know, I think sometimes people get more concerned about if they're gonna buy my music. I'm not trying to be Beyonce. I don't need that type of um flavor <laughs> around my life. I, I just don't. And I'm not I'm not throwing shade on her. And I'm, I'm just saying that everybody has their niche. And when you find that niche or you find something that you really want to do or something that really speaks to you and you can use that to speak to others, then you've done what it is that you are supposed to do. I realize 
just doing this, that this circle that I am continuing called my life has happened because I had people in that circle which is why I put that up there because those circle of people helped me be who I am. Everyone propelled me, not by a push, but everybody moved me forward in a different place than I thought I was going. I would never, if I looked at myself 50, 20 years ago, I would have never been having this conversation hmm. because that's not who I was. The person that I was on Song for M it's different than the person that I am today. But it took that experience for me to have this. So I am still, I am still a work in progress. And I don't mind saying that because that lets me know that I still have work to do. And so I will always be a lifelong learner. I'm always going to be still learning. And I'm just, when I saw this butterfly, I love butterflies. I don't know why. You can't catch them. And maybe that's one thing. I tried to catch a blue butterfly in Costa Rica. I'm still chasing that butterfly because every time I got my camera right where I thought I was going to get them, <laughs> flew away. <laughs> so I um, am working on my own project of my own poetry um, that I'm calling heartstrings, and it just this is just part of the uh, lyrics. If I could capture your attention for a moment, I realize I would keep you close to me. While it is impossible to always have you in my view, those times I see you make me want to draw closer to you. And that project will be called Heartstrings, and it's got some. And it's for sisters on a, any ordinary day. Wow. So, or anybody who wants to, but that's what it's for. So that's who I am. I, I hope I've kept you awake. Um, I was asked to do this. I am grateful for this opportunity. It has been a blast, actually a blast from my past. <laughs> but a blast is so good uh, to see Roberta on here because we have, cross paths over time <laughs> so it's good and and ralph and i sat next to each other in harmony class uh i don't know if we learned anything but we did learn one four five <laughs> and some other things uh in that class and a shout out to anybody on here that went to cast technical high school i think it is one of the best high schools in the entire planet and I thank uh, everybody who has been in my life to make my life work. And shout out to my daughter because I know she's watching her mother. I love you and I love your family. And I thank you for this opportunity. And if there are any questions, you have five minutes. No, because <laughs> I know they go off at nine. Come on, sister. Talk. <laughs> we'll take as long as you would like. Okay. Any questions? Roberta, uh, go ahead. June Ann just uh, sent in the chat, true artist and creator, thanks for sharing your journey, uh, uh, journey, inspiring. Oh, thank and you. Can I ask you a question? I would like sure. To ask you. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm also a composer and it's so interesting to, uh, having some th some things being uh, told or explained in a perspective of mm -hmm. a composer. Uh, usually uh, you see, for example, journalists talks about a uh, composition and uh, you see other, other fields of knowledge talking about some kind of subjects. And uh, uh, it's very interesting uh, to have these the uh, all these things that you, you brought in, in your in this amazing uh, live stream and uh, and talking about it from this perspective. And one thing that me and Ralph uh, we always are debating and discussing is about uh, uh, labels and uh categorization of of music so we have we've had plenty discussions about uh, the word jazz 
And uh, recently when uh, he told me about you, we had some conversations about the concept of art music. And uh -huh. for my understanding, I might be wrong because English is not my first language, but uh, art music uh, is uh, a, a more recent substitute to the term classical music in some kind of point or is something different? No, or it's really not. It's really not different. And it's it's really it's really an art song rather than art music because it's it's so, solo voice and it's not the first one but it's usually a solo voice, um, and the text is usually poetry. Mm. The text is usually poetry, so it's a setting of a poem for for a solo voice, um, and not because all music is an art form, whatever it is. So all music is an art form. But I think um, I'm not categorizing it, you know, but it is, it's like there's blues, there's spirituals, there's gospel. There are all types of, of different genres of music and most of them somehow intersect in some way or forth uh, or that. Yeah, they intersect in some way. And so it's not, I think one of the things that I hope that I portrayed and what I've learned is that there is the, the category, the category itself is music. So it doesn't matter where you fall in that because, which is why I hope, you know, I started with thinking I was going in one direction. I know that the direction that my parents had for me early on was for me to be a classical pianist. But somehow when I when I got introduced to the harp and I knew about Dorothy Ashby, I was like, I want to be her. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, but she yeah. had a different skill set. So art song, when we think of it, it's just a, a genre of music. It's just called an art song because it just usually you have something that you put the text to music. Yeah. Hey, Juan, could it's you uh, unmute uh, Roberta, please? It's usually done with the piano and solo voice. So instead of everything being uh, classical, uh, how could I say it, an aria, um, usually that's done in a language. And many times people listen to different arias and they have no idea what the person is singing, <laughs> singing about, but it's beautiful and they enjoy it. And especially if it's a soprano who can go up to the stratosphere or it's a, a bass who can go down, you know, to the dungeon. Um, it's just a form of music for solo voice. Does that make it? Yeah, that's that understandable. Is, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think, you know, the, th the thing that I hope everybody leaves here with is I did not, until I heard people say I was a composer, I never considered myself to be that. I know I arrange songs because I love spirituals um, and I love women's voices. So I had an opportunity to put those together. I, I love choirs because I've always been in a choir. I grew up on choirs who are the American or even African with whom you would like to work on? Um, I'll well, answer that question. One, one, one question. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Juan, could you unmute Roberta? She's been wanting to ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did already. Did First I answer thing. your question, Juan? Did I answer? <laughs> yeah. Did I answer Ilham may have the question. My question is- Hold, uh, hold on, is, hold on, Ilham. Know? Hold on, Ilham. Okay. okay. Roberta's gone. First of all, I just want to say I'm just happy to be in your presence this evening. It's been very most inspiring. And you know how they say it takes one to know one? Well, you were claiming someone was a superwoman. Well, it takes a superwoman to know a superwoman. And I want to say <laughs> with all of your accomplishments and things that you have done, you are definitely a superwoman. And in addition to that, you're living your life like it's golden. And that's yes. just awesome. And one other little piece, uh, which you just made, very true. We always talk about people need to see, and we tell our children, you need to see it to achieve it. And your comment about seeing Dorothy Ashby and seeing other people, you 
got on your journey and said, that's what I want to do. And you've accomplished that. So congratulations to you. And from your poem, I think the last couple lines, you said something about getting closer together so that whatever we evolve, but I'd like us to, uh, my email so that we can reconnect again. Okay. Thank okay. you, uh, Dr. Jones. Oh, me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Denise or Ilham, it doesn't matter. Ilham? Oh, hi. Um, you know, I was reflecting on art songs and I was excited about hearing the the term art music. But you know what? I thought that, well, let me put it this way. I, I had assumed that when she said it was art music, when you said it was art music, while I was listening to it, I was like, oh, and then when I heard him sing it, I was like, okay, that's art music. That, that's art music. But I thought, because I've been inspired by a work of art and I wrote a song to that work of art, a painting that a young woman at our church painted and it's called Living Water. And when you look at this painting, you can see, you can practically see the water flowing from the mountains down into the valley. And I wrote a song called Living Water, taken from the, the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. So I thought that was art. And see, when I get ready to release it, I didn't know what to release it as because it's not jazz. Here we go again with the genres. And I was gonna call it an art song. What, is, what, is, what are you all's ideas on that? Okay, so let me let me say this. And it's really I'm glad that we're having this conversation because I wanted to, I want to piggyback off of what you're saying. Are you familiar with um oh Ramir Bearden? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you familiar with August Wilson, the playwright? I want you to go back and look at his play because a lot of his plays were inspired by a painting, which is a work of art. But a it's an art song, which is a genre of music that is just really for solo voice and piano accompaniment in the classical tradition. Got and it. I wanna, okay. I wanna make that clear, so. Okay. Um, yeah, and this but, song, is yeah. it's got instrumentation to it. Full yeah. orchestra instrumentation, right. um, <laughs> flutes and harps, and so that would not be an art song. No, that's gotcha. just a composition. I mean, it's a composition yeah. that's that's a, it's a sacred composition. Yeah, uh, I've done I've done those two. Um, I I I've written a couple of things for SSA and for solo boys, yeah, based on scriptures, but it is not an art song. It is Got a it. sacred song. Got it. Okay. Okay. So I want to make sure that I, I don't want anybody to leave off of here thinking that, you know, you see a picture, you write about it. No, there are some pictures that you want to write about, but for the most part, it's poetry. And it doesn't have to be African-American poetry. That's the genre that I chose to yeah. use. There are a lot of art songs and that's, and I, I want everybody to be clear about that definition and as right, I say, right. Have a test. Everybody's going to go and look up art songs. So right, know what it is, and there is a whole, there is an alliance of uh, the African American Art Song Alliance. Yeah, where that that's one thing, okay. but it is really a group of, um, not the group itself, not the alliance. But I want everyone to know that it is just however you want to do to do it. It is not necessary. It could be inspired by art, but it would not be called an art Got song. It. Got if it. That, okay. It, that, yeah. That it's not it an up art song. Yeah. And I know that text very well. Um, and Thank so, you. yeah. Yeah. Okay. That clears it up for me. Definitely. Okay. And uh, uh, Ilham? Ilham? Yes. Yeah. My question is just to know if um, 
there is uh, if there is American or even African musician with whom uh, you would like to work with on a future project, for example. Oh. I that that's a hard question. I have to think about that. I wish I could talk with Gregory Porter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> only because I think his uh that would be in some ways a different type, even though he's, you know, we're getting into these class these uh classifications, but I think I would classify him if I had to do that, uh, maybe as a jazz artist, but my understanding is a lot of his music. He yeah. has done the text. Um, I'm not sure. I think the person that I would like to work with the most would probably be Quincy Jones, but I wouldn't want to work with him. I just want to pick his brain. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Because I just <laughs> think his brain has got to be, it needs to go in yeah. um, a museum. And I think the other person would probably be... Uh, other two people would be Mervyn Warren, who was part of Take Six, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Stevie Wonder. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because yeah. he is, mm -hmm. he's boundless. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I talked about Dorothy Ashby earlier. Um, it's the solo piece. What is it you say it was, Ralph? Uh, when was the if last? It's magic. Oh, he said, okay. I just love that's Dorothy Ashby on there. And she's also on stuff on Earth, Wind, and Fire and stuff with Luther. Uh, she left, when she left the Detroit area, she became a studio musician when there was a whole group of musicians uh, that went to California. But I hope everybody is clear about art songs. Oh, and she did I that only beautiful piece that. with uh, uh, with Bill Withers and and. Yeah. and in her, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I just, you know, it's where I was. I started being a performing artist. I fell in love with teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, my first year, my like within the first three weeks, I was like, these kids are really doing what I'm saying. <laughs> and uh, they were so talented. My my first two schools. Um, the students were so amazing, just so amazing, just came with so many, so many skills. And when I, when I think of my professional career as a teacher, a teacher, a music educator, mm -hmm. I just met some wonderful people in my classrooms who just really inspired me, not because they did what I asked them to, but just because they bought so many gifts to the table. And as a teacher, we're supposed to bring those gifts out. And even though that was long ago, we are still, many of them, still in touch with each other. I mean, we're we're friends now, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, there is nothing that I would take for that journey, that I wouldn't take for that journey of teaching, even at the university level, but the K-12, yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I have a question. Yes. Sylvia, do you ever compose before you see the, you know, just it compositionally and then look at a poem or does a poem that you hear inspires what you've done from a comp musical composition? You say, well, this is for this or uh, I'm writing this music because I'm inspired you know, yes, yeah. I I do write where I just might hear something. Uh, sometimes I wake up with a melody in my head. I don't know where it's supposed to go to or if it's supposed to go to anything. But I've learned to I keep my phone by me, at least the recorder. And if I hear something in my head, I'll just sing it. And then go to the piano because I'm an alto. And what I might be thinking might be higher. So I just, you know, transpose it. Um, I listen to sounds from different places too, like uh, alarm clocks. Some of them have little melodies. Um, you just hear things, 
you know, the birds, they have a very interesting um, conversation uh, sometimes out my window and I try and duplicate that. Um, they talk very fast uh, and I'm fascinated with trees because trees, they may not talk, but when the wind comes, you hear this uh, kind of dialogue that they have. And uh, when they stop, it's it's like they just, it's that silence that they have. And then they start moving to again. And so you see like rhythm in the trees and how they move. So you, you don't know if you're going to do trills or, or, you know, that 30 second notes. Uh, but I listen differently. You know, I think music causes you to listen differently. And if I can put text and music together, then I'm on a roll. And it takes, a, it's a process. I really have to, as I was doing uh, the first part of that song cycle, uh, My People, I had to think about what did that look like to me? And I wanted it to be regal. Um, and I, I don't have a clip of it, but I, I I saw, I see royal people. When I did Susanna Jones sings uh, Where's Red, I see her. Uh, regal. So how do you capture what you see, not only in the words, but what is it that you want to convey for people to hear? So that when they, when they hear it, like when I'm talking about writing something about somebody being in sorrow, uh, I want you to hear the sorrow. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's just something that that you have to work on. But I can tell you, I did not plan to be here at this in this part of my life. I when somebody called me a composer, I looked at them like they were crazy. <laughs> and then I have just decided to, if that's what you say I am, then that's what I am. But I I go about it. Uh, I remember I wrote a choral piece, S S A A T T B B flute, piano, organ, and I turned it into a publisher. Um, I had a publisher look at it, and I remember him saying to me, "You must think you have a voice of a hundred. You must have a choir of a hundred voices. It's too much." Mm. And I said, "Well." I did it with a choir of 40 and they did a great job. And so that's when I decided that I did not need anybody to co-sign what I do. Right. And that's how I just started doing my own publishing because I'm not doing it for money or fame. Mm -hmm. I want to hold on to my music. I do it because I'm inspired. And so I just do everything myself. I scribe it. <laughs> Um, I, I publish it, um, and I, I enjoy it. I, you know, there are some people who I think are prolific composers and they are who I will say, what do you think about this? I need you to look, you know, look at that. Cause I don't know everything. Um, and it's a process, but it is it is probably one of the best things at this time in my life that I'm glad that I've done and I am continuing to do. Because if somebody said, write a song, I would just, I, I remember a friend of mine, uh, her daughter got married and she said she wanted me to write a song for her wedding. And I was like, uh, how about uh, Three Blind Mice or <laughs> something like that? But I did, she gave me the text. And I wrote it. And when it's not that you need anybody to co-sign what you write, but if somebody sings it or plays it and they say, I like that. Yeah. yeah. That's, all. that's all that matters. Because I'm not, you know, everybody's <clears throat> not going to do everything. There's so much music out here. It's, it's crazy. Even the music that silence is crazy. Mm -hmm. So... Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions out here?
Uh, we just had some comments. Let me share with you. I think we can do this just for the need to see what was going on. We had just comments in the chat from Kalila, from Gloria Baker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kalila. Kalila. Oh, I'm sorry, Kalila. Oh, that's all right. It's all right. Order. Well, I thank everybody that was on. I learned a lot. I hope you learned a lot. Tomorrow is Good Friday. I have a long service, <laughs> but I am oh, turn that turn that off. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be a great day. Sylvia, so, do you want to do you want to share your email with you know you have some some really incredible singers and composers. I know. Uh, it's up to you. I, I, you know, I don't yeah, want. Yeah, no problem. You know, um, Roberta had asked. I'm sure Denise would want to, you know, um, contact you at some point. You know, um, okay. Because she My, has that genre I told you about, uh, gospel cool, which is, yeah. you know, I, I really would like for you to, you know, you guys to. This is one of the things that we do with ASM. You know, we network. Yeah. And we share information. That's what they call the cipher. That's what, you know, the, the hip hop uh, people call the cipher. So we yep. share information and we give information and we receive information. So if you want to do that, you could put that in the chat. It's up to you. Thank you, Charles, by the way. You know, those of you that came in on our uh, and joined in on our. Yeah. OK. That's you, huh? Yes. When she said living water, I said, oh, I know that text. <laughs> and I, I love the excerpt from the, your poem that you showed at the end. It's very beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's that's heartstrings. Um, I'm going to finish it. It's about, oh, about six poems. I got to find at least three of them. I, I wrote them a while ago, and then I said, you know what? I'm just going to write my own poetry to music. You there, know? You so, there you go. There you go. Beautiful. I've already started. Wonderful. Listen, I want to thank you, Sylvia. You know, um, how wonderful it is to con reconnect, yes. you know, through all these times. And, you know, we're still, we're still vertical. What a blessing yes. that is. Amen. Uh, you know, that we can see and technology has allowed us to to uh, to visit each other, you know what a what a great thing, and I want to invite you back to our further uh, sessions that we'll be having um, on ASM. Uh, we will continue with our live stream, and in uh, on the eleventh of April, I believe we will begin doing our ASM, aesthetically speaking, music, our regular modules. Uh, but we will be going to one one day a week for the on Thursdays for the uh, ASM module, and then we will do Tuesdays, which we will continue with our live stream because I think it's been very successful. But we want to continue uh, to have it grow, and you have been an outstanding uh, uh, guest. Thank you. Uh, would you say so, Roberta? Definitely. We can have her back again. Yeah, I'm telling you. Oh, so so wonderful. And, and and you know, we all go back. I mean, there's some people here that that you know we, we go back to very, very early. Yeah. So I know we go back to the mid 60s. Mm. Uh Sylvia and Roberta and uh there's some other and you know when she talked up when you talked about the petty players, mm -hmm. you know, yes. that was really you know something very special at that time, what they were doing. And, um, you know, I was in high school, uh, as was Charles Scruggs, with the the uh, James Petty and his brother Paul Petty. Mm -hmm. You know, they were tuba players at Central High School, you know, uh, just, you know, and, and very gifted, uh, uh, very talented, you know. So thank you for, for bringing that name out and exposing some people to that, that, that particular uh, uh, on uh, unit of playwrights. Was yeah. there, did your path cross with Brazil Denard's group at all? Was there any? Yes, yes. In fact, my uh, dad's 
my dad's corral was the precursor to that because uh -huh. Brazil, my father was older, he had one. And then Brazil was kind of, they were colleagues, so to speak, uh, in the Detroit Musicians Association. So um, yes, but before we even leave, I, I have to thank Juan and I have to thank Ilham for uh, not only the pleasure of meeting you, but for your input in uh, bringing this all together uh, the introduction that you had that was on <laughs> on the thing that I received, the announcement about today, I was like, oh, I'm going to go hear her. Who is that? <laughs> so I, I want to thank you uh, for introducing me in such a wonderful way and uh, Ralph for digging up uh, the music. Um, I, I will continue to be a work in progress. And, uh, you know, Roberta knows me not only from the past, but our paths have crossed uh, through our church life as well. Right. And um, and so you you just never know. And shout out to uh, Reverend Hill, uh, Reverend Dr. Hill, I'll pass uh, on. that, um, you know, you just never know where you're going to be. And uh Ilham, if I get a chance, I'm going to take you up on that offer. I just have to get myself together um, in how that may look and when it will happen. And I thank everybody who was on that was listening, uh, learned yeah. that it is not necessarily um, the quantity of people who attend, but the quality of the people who do things. So thank you for being uh a quality opportunity for me. And um, I hope that I can come again. And I just didn't have rehearsal today. So thank um, you, Sylvia. Thank, thank you. On a Thursday. You know, a word came a word came into my my mind as you were speaking about and showing, you know, your works and your influences and everything. And that word was legacy. And and you've left a, a legacy of work and experiences or others, you know, which is what we do. We, you know, we can't always do it in the moment, but we do things and we leave these things for 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 those that come after us. So, yeah. you know, I want to thank you for that, Sylvia. And um, uh, thank you for everybody that joined us tonight. You know, I'm going to, let's see, we're at, we're at uh, almost at, at, well, we are at the end of our, uh, of our discussions and everything. And, uh, so I'm going to say good night to everyone. You know, okay. Peace. And I'm going to say Ashe and peace. And, ashe. And yes, absolutely. Because this was an Ashe moment, Sylvia. You know, yeah. we will speak. Um, yeah. Tell tell my cousin you said hello hello at Good Friday service if you get a chance to. I invited. Okay. I don't know if she's she okay. or not. But at any rate, you know, uh, there's a deep deep Detroit connection here. We're, yeah. Everywhere we go, there's a deep Detroit connection. You know, Ilham, I think it's what, two in the morning there, two thirty. Uh, it's two twenty-five. Oh my oh. god! Uh -huh. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> night, night. Oh. The night, night. I would say good night to you, and you're smiling. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy, and my cat is waiting for me that we can go to sleep. He's oh. hiding in my vest. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! That's beautiful. Well, enjoy the weekend. Because it was we we does also he enjoyed the session. Okay, yeah. and thank you for everything. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank Sylvia, you. you can see we're connected on four continents. Yeah, I see. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> yeah, you know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, as they say. On Hazelwood, I'm fitting to bounce. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Uh, Peace. <laughs>